a couple of weeks ago, Josh and I were sitting on our couch in the morning doing devotions, and I said to Josh, what book of the Bible should I read now? And he said, well, the Gospels really are the heart of the Bible, so you probably can't read those enough. And I said, sure enough, and I got to reading. Today, our scripture comes from the Gospels, specifically the Gospel of John. In this new year, we'll be going back to the Gospel of John time and time again throughout the year. Listen for the word of God as it speaks to us this morning from John chapter 1, verses 29 to 42. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I, this is John the Baptist speaking, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following him, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Over the past several decades, the religious landscape of our country has significantly changed. A quick Google search about church attendance yields headlines like, church membership down sharply in the past two decades, and church leaders and declining religious service attendance, and decline of Christianity continues at rapid pace. And it's true. Less and less Americans are attending church these days or making a commitment to join a church. Some theorize that as a country becomes more modernized, more intellectually sophisticated, then pre-modern superstitions like religion will naturally fall away. Some even say that this is for the best, best for a society, because religion has provoked wars and genocides. Unfortunately, the Christian record on this doesn't look that great. The Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, the Salem Witch Trials, the Holocaust— All tragedies done not just at the hands of religion, but at the hands of Christianity. For those who think the world would be more peaceful without religion, the slow extinguishing of religious fire is a good thing. Yet, despite poll numbers that indicate our country is moving further away from religion, if you study our society closely— The religious desire is as strong as ever. It's going nowhere. The desire to follow a way of life, to live in a way that feels righteous, to be devoted to something, that desire 
still flows deeply and freely throughout our society. As Pastor David Zoll explains, he says the religious impulse is easier to rebrand than it is to extinguish. This runs counter to popular perception. We assume that more and more people are abandoning faith and making their own meaning. Polls tell us that confidence in the religious narratives we've inherited has collapsed. But what polls fail to report is that the marketplace of replacement religion is booming. The marketplace of replacement religion is booming. Now our culture is turning other aspects of life into religion. Busyness, romance, parenting, technology, work, even food, and especially politics. All becoming religions in our culture. The evangelistic pull of these religions reaches all of us, even those of us squarely in the church. I bet you're already familiar with it. Political parties and candidates seek our loyalty with a tsunami of money and time. Our phones, feeds, and screens constantly nudge us for our attention. Our culture encourages judgmentalism about the way people parent, work, and love. Everything is now vying for our religious energy, for our devotion. Sure, all of these things, family, work, romance, politics, they all have their place. But now they're vying for the number one place, for the prioritized place of devotion in our lives. And in some way, they're, they're kind of getting it from us. I mean, I wish I thought of Jesus as often as I reach for my own phone to check something. It's all the time. Zal says, we may be sleeping in on Sunday mornings in greater numbers, but we've never been more pious as a society. Well, our story from the Gospel of John might have something to show us about how to navigate these many religions seeking our attention and devotion. John, like the other Gospels, except for Mark, has a lot of buildup before Jesus actually shows up and starts speaking. First, the Gospel of John begins with that stunning, beautiful prologue. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John sets Jesus up right from the beginning as the cosmic Son of God. Right from the beginning, no secrets with John. John, the gospel writer, immediately follows the eloquent prologue with John the Baptist shouting, prepare the way of the Lord. The next day, John talks about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he tells the story of baptizing Jesus, how the Spirit descended like a dove and remained on Jesus. John says, I have seen that this is the Son of God. Through all of this, Jesus hasn't really been present. Even in the baptism, John is more reporting what happened than Jesus being an active character yet. But finally, the gospel tells us, the next day, John the Baptist is standing around with two of his disciples, probably shooting the breeze, and Jesus casually walks by, minding his own business. Not much of a grand entrance, but that's Jesus' style. Fortunately, John elbows his disciples in the side mid-conversation and says, Shh, guys, it's him. Behold, the Lamb of God. Well, I'm sure these disciples are thinking, just yesterday John was telling us about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was telling us that this guy's baptism proved that he was the Son of God. Well, with that introduction, the two disciples can't help but follow Jesus around. And wherever and however long they follow him, Jesus eventually notices them and turns around and speaks the very 
first words we get from Jesus in the Gospel of John. After 30 years of growing and preparation, Jesus finally clears his throat to speak his first words of official Messiah business. And you know what he says? What are you searching for? Oh, of all the things for John to first record Jesus saying, it's a question that echoes through the pages of Scripture, reverberates through history, and we can hear it even in this room. What are you searching for? For connection? For friends that really know you? For something you can feel completely devoted to? For a feeling of purpose or a sense of clear direction? What about for someone who could be your partner in life or in love? For assurance that you're on the right track as a, as a parent or as in your work? What about for something to come in and shake up the monotony of your life? Or for a reprieve from the constant voice of judgment and condemnation? We are all searching. People are searching everywhere for meaning, for connection, for purpose, for hope, for knowledge that we're good enough, searching for God. So don't be fooled by the headlines that America is becoming less religious. People are searching. What are you searching for? Jesus asks. Now, these two disciples respond in a curious way. They answer with none of the possibilities that I just listed. Instead, they say, Rabbi, where are you staying? It seems like they're inquiring about his lodging. Like, hey, Rabbi, are you couch surfing these days? Are you still living with your parents? Have you gotten your own place? Where are you staying? But it only seems like this because the English sometimes can't totally grasp what's going on in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, the word for where Jesus is staying is the word meno. M-E-N-O, transliterated. It means to remain, dwell, or abide. To remain, dwell, or abide. This is one of John's favorite words to use in all of the gospel. He uses it so many times. When the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus and remains on him, it menos on him. Later, when Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, if you abide in me, if you meno in me, then you will bear much fruit. So really, what the disciples are asking Jesus is not where he's living, but Jesus, where do you belong? Where do you fit? To whom are you connected? Are you really God's son? And beneath all of that, they're really asking, can you possibly be the answer to all that we are seeking? Because the truth is that while family, work, romance, politics, and technology all have their place, none of them truly fit that ultimate, fundamental, even religious, dare I say, desire for one to abide with us. Only God truly fills that desire. Only God. So they ask, Teacher, where are you abiding? Are you the answer? And to that, Jesus says, Come and see. Jesus is not anxious or defensive about who he is at all. He just says, Come and see. So the disciples begin following Jesus. They begin becoming Jesus' disciples. They begin menowing, remaining with him. And by the end of one afternoon with Jesus, Andrew goes to find his brother, Simon Peter, and tells him, we have found the Messiah. Simply spending a few hours with Jesus showed answer, 
Andrew the answer to all of his longing, to all of our longing, to all of our society's longing? Yes. Yes, this guy is the real deal. He will heal the sick. He will bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim release to the captives and the prisoners. He will turn society upside down. He will meno. He will remain with Andrew and Peter through thick and thin. He will dwell with them through faith and doubt. He will abide with them through life and through death. Jesus abides with his disciples. He abides with us. One of the most ancient prayers in Christianity kind of gets at this abiding. Abide in me and and I will abide in you, Jesus says. And the prayer goes like this. Lord, my soul is restless until it rests in you. In fact, you can sync this prayer up with your breath. Will you try this with me? All you have to do is breathe. Take a big, deep breath in. Lord, my soul is restless. Exhale. Until it rests in you. Lord, my soul is restless. Until it rests in you. Jesus is where our souls find completion and rest Family, work, technology, politics, they want our religious energy, but they cannot give us true rest. They end up becoming pharisaic taskmasters with no grace to offer us. Jesus is where we can meno, where we can remain, abide, dwell. Andrew must have gone to his brother Simon and said, Simon, this is it. We have found the Messiah. And you know what? We can have front seats. Are you searching? Searching for a savior? Searching for a purpose? Searching for meaning? Come and see. Come up close to the word of God. Read about this Jesus, the one who abides with us. Come and see. Let your soul find rest. Look, you don't have to just take my word for it. You don't have to believe this story about Jesus just because I say so. Just come and see. Dwell and abide in his word long enough, and you'll begin to find what you're searching for. You can't read the Gospels too much. And as you read about this Jesus, you'll become more and more of a disciple. God will abide with you. Lord, our souls are restless until they rest in you.